recently read in a study that we make about 35,000 decisions in a day. I believe that. Think about it. What should I wear today? What time should I leave home so that I'm not late for the talks? Mediterranean pasta, barbecue chicken? <laughs> we all made this decision today. These are mundane decisions and we make a lot of them on, uh, every day. But we also make bigger, more important decisions, life-changing decisions, such as should I have children? Should I keep my job or just stay where I am? Thing is, we don't always make the best decisions. So it is very important to understand how do we navigate these choices? What goes on to making decisions? How can we do that better? So let me walk you through an example. Imagine that your boss comes to you and says, listen, we have this major client down there in Florida that we really need somebody from the company to go and like, you know, make a great you know, deal with. It might take six months, a year or something, but we really need somebody to go there. What do you say? Well, what do we say? Most of you also, I hope, are already thinking, what about the family? Like, can I bring the, ki the kids? And so the boss has always sorted out. There's school for the kids and your partner can come. They will be like, you know, on a paid uh, leave of absence. So what are we saying? Oh, you know what? After this harsh winter, who doesn't dream of a nice, relaxing time on a beach in Florida? Cocktail, ma'am? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Oh, maybe I go snorkeling instead. Well, what are we waiting for? What are you waiting for? Let's go. I'm already having a cocktail here. <laughs> well, in the meantime, <laughs> don't you remember this article that your cousin posted on the social media not so long ago? Hmm. Alligators, ooh. Yeah, there are alligators in South Florida. So is it really a good idea to go after all with the kids? So we are torn. <laughs> On the one hand, the nice sun, beach, great times. But alligators! <laughs> well, let me tell you something. None of this actually matters. Why? Because if you have to guide your decision based on this information, you're basically listening to your affect. Either something that sounds awesome and great, or something that sounds absolutely terrifying. But really, the picture that I drew about Florida is no more than a stereotype, what we think about when we go there for vacation. But you're going there for work. Maybe you're gonna be like inland, and maybe it's a pain to go and drive to the beach. Nothing like fun like this, right? And alligators, come on, this was an anecdote. Of course there are like, you know, terrifying wildlife down there, but, you know, the chances that you even see an alligator are very, like, you know, little. In fact, you have more chances to be badly bitten by a spider or a snake in South Florida than even see an alligator. But these don't make the news. They don't sound any better, but they don't make the news. <laughs> so these are examples of the mental shortcuts that we use all the time to make decisions. These are the cognitive biases that we rely on to make decisions. And we don't know that. This is not good. This is not, not any better than making random decisions. This is not any better than, you know, going there, shake a magic eight apple, asking for, like, you know, guidance when you face a, a, a difficult decision. What should I do? <laughs> Quick. <laughs> no. no what? I don't know. We don't want that, obviously. What we want is good decision making. We need a more objective way of making decisions. And how do we do that? Well, let's look at the facts. Let's get some data. So perhaps being worried about alligators is a bit of irrational thinking here, but gun violence might be something we should be worried about. Should we be concerned? Well, let's look at some data. Here's a chart that shows you the number of murders uh, committed by firearms in the state of Florida for the past 30 years. 
And as many of you may remember, in 2005, Florida was the first state in the United States of enacting that law, stand your ground law, that basically makes it legal to shoot one's way out of any situation that feels threatening. And clearly in this chart, we see a drop after this law was enacted. Does it mean that the state is safer and that the very fact that it is legal for you to shoot somebody when you feel threatened discourage crime as a whole? Well, we wish. But is that the story that this chart is telling us? Have you paid attention to the axis in this chart? The y-axis goes downwards. So if I put that back up, and in chronological order, this is a chart that should have been presented to you, but that was an official chart. It is not that the chart, the previous chart, was technically lying to you because all of the information was there. It is just that as an audience, we have expectations of a chart like such to have a y-axis going up. And so it is very easy for us to be misled. So where are we at now? I told you we cannot rely on ourselves to make decisions because we are heavily biased. I told you to look at facts and I present you facts and then we were going to make like the exact opposite decision or conclusion using this chart. Well, what can we do now? So I'm going to present you with three ways where you can actually hone your skills of working with data and hopefully make better decisions with them. So, not to make Florida sound like an unappealing place, I'm actually very excited to go there pretty soon, so none of this discourages me whatsoever, but beside the terrifying wildlife, I've been thinking about that a lot, the terrifying wildlife and the gun violence, Florida is also known to be vulnerable to hurricanes. All right, so we've, we've accepted this job and we're there and there comes a hurricane alert. How do we decide whether we evacuate or not? This is the kind of information that you may be seeing in the news. A six to 13 foot inundation of the coast. Can you imagine? Should we escape? Should we evacuate? What are these numbers? This is a range, and where is it located? Well, a natural way of presenting this data a little bit better is to use a map like such. This is an official map. But the color here is a bit confusing to me. So does you know, blue mean more water? Does red mean more damages? Are we safe in the gray area? And even if you pay close attention to what's going on, still, what is three feet worth of flooding? or six feet, or nine feet, wherever you stand in this map. Well, let me present you this data in a very different way. This is a person standing there, as it would be like if you were there. So it's a person like you and me, and here's the water coming. So this is what, what was it? Three feet, right? This is what three feet of water would be like if you were there on site. I don't know you, but I'm very far from me having a cocktail and being relaxed or anything, right? And if that wasn't enough, here's six feet. I'm still standing here. Maybe we should get going, right? And if it's not enough, here we go to all the way up to nine feet and you see the wind and everything. We don't want that. We're literally drowning under nine feet of water. So now, clearly, you have a very visceral experience of what it would be like if you were there. So these numbers should now mean something very different to you. And this problem of communicating numbers and facts is a global problem. We're constantly being faced with facts, numbers, data, to learn about our world and to, to navigate this world. And this touches things like global health or climate change, for example. Did you know that we lost 129 hectares of forest over a 25-year period. What is that? 25 years is as long as our students at the university have been alive for. This is a long time. Well, how about we try something different? This is equivalent to losing 20 soccer fields worth of trees every minute for 25 years. Now we have concepts and numbers that we can navigate, that we understand. A soccer field and a minute. Everybody knows what a minute is, right? But do we have this visceral experience of what a minute is in this context of deforestation? Well, let's try something different again. Let's see how fast you can color in 20 soccer fields 
and I give you a minute. Fail. <laughs> you made it only half, like barely past, you know, halfway through. Point is, bulldozers don't fail. They get it every single minute. And then I've done so for the past 25 years. So these two examples were examples of how you can experience your data. Viscerally experiencing your numbers in space and in time. And there is value in re-expressing these complex concepts into something that we can physically and viscerally experience because our mental shortcuts use precisely past experiences when we make decisions. So we can wire it this way. So in my work, I study the cognitive mechanisms uh, that are associated with making sense of data, making decisions with data, and how these cognitive mechanisms can help um, inform visual communication of complex uh, numbers. So let's experience some more data here. Who in this room is drinking soda? Wow, you're a good crowd. Everybody made the right decision, apparently. <laughs> good. All right. Let me phrase it this way. Is it a good decision to drink soda? Well, if you learn the lesson, you will tell me, like, Fanny, let's look at the facts. We cannot just, like, make it up. Here are the facts. There is 39 grams of sugar in a can of soda. How much is that? Do you have a good sense of scale when it comes to grams of sugar? Well, this is worth 10 sugar cubes. Do you see yourself putting 10 sugar cubes in your mug of coffee? Even if it's a very large mug, this is a lot. So now you have a very different experience with this very uh, number, 39, of, uh, 39 grams of sugars. This is a big crater that you can visit in South Africa. And this crater is actually the result of rock excavation to mine precious gems. This is large, I don't have any better way of showing this, but the thing is, it's been excavated like to mine something, like a pile of diamond, that is worth the size of a beach ball. Here you can see the beach ball, very tiny. So is it worth it, really? Think about it the next time you go and want to buy a precious gem. This is also what you pay for. So now you may not yourself make this visualization, this visual communication, but there is value in re-expressing the hard numbers into something that you can have a visceral experience with. Now what you can do today is engage with your data. You already engage with data every day, but be more deliberate about it, be more mindful about it, and think about how you leverage data to make decisions. And there's a lot of data about yourself that you can already play with. So here's, for example, my pattern of drinking for the past week. And you may already be thinking, well, what a boring person. She always has the same routine in the morning. Glass of water, double espresso. Sure, maybe I should put a twist on the weekend, orange juice. I don't know. I sound very boring. And maybe you're concerned about me, as you see on Monday, how much coffee I drank. But if you know me, you look also at Sunday and you say, like, ah, she was in a plane, so she must have been tired on Monday. Why was I in a plane? Because you see tomato juice. <laughs> Who drinks tomato juice but in a plane? <laughs> Not me. So there's a lot of data about yourself that you can already play with. And it, actually, this type of visualization, handcrafted visualizations, have been popularized by these artists who used to send each other every week data about themselves to their friend overseas. And they collected all of these postcards in a book, a beautiful book that is called Dear Data. I love this title, Dear Data. That's precisely what I mean here. Be friend with your data, engage with your data. You will learn actually what goes into, you know, creating data, processing data, and visualizing data. So maybe you become better at this. And you don't have to like go through this very like, tedious manual process. There's a lot of data about yourself that you can already have access to. For example, the data you generate on Facebook, the data on your phone of how much you've used whatever app, um, or the Fitbit application if you have 
those tracking devices. And you can use one of the tools that we develop in my lab to make this artistic process a little bit less tedious. So here is a video that shows my pattern of negative sentiments for a, a week. So each sentiment is represented by a drop, and the more negative the sentiment, the darker the drop. And the more intense the sentiment, the bigger the drop. So you have full control over the creative process, but still, the tool is helping you so you don't have to color in every single drop. And when you change your mind, it updates accordingly. So my point with this example is like if you engage with your data, if you go through this process yourself of collecting and analyzing and visualizing this data, the next time you're being exposed to a data chart, you have a more precise understanding of what went into the decisions of making this chart. And maybe you may have a more critical eye onto what is presented to you. So data literacy is a skill that we need to practice and that we need to teach. If you have children, and this is my third takeaway, I really encourage you to have them engage with, manipulate, uh, and think with data. It's very important. In my work, I developed some tools to facilitate the work of the instructors in elementary school to teach children about visualization and data literacy. But as parents, you can already engage your children into collecting data about themselves, about the family, about the world that's around us, and have them make visualization out of that. And by doing so, you will help them be more equipped, better equipped, to navigate this world that is heavily guided by data facts. So making decisions with data is a skill. Making good decisions with data is a skill. It's something that we need to practice. So today we are surrounded by data facts and so on, and by using these tools, re-expressing your data so that you have a more visceral, physical experience with, by engaging with your data more, reclaiming ownership on your data, and by teaching data to yourself and to the generation to come, maybe we take better part in the discussion and make better decisions for ourselves. Thank you. Yeah.